Today's lesson is on, does music boost your cognitive performance? First, we're going to look at playing music, and then we're going to look at listening to music. So there's two separate things, and they both affect your brain in different ways. So first of all, we'll look at playing music. This is just a little sagittal section, which means if you looked at your brain and you cut it in half, straight through the middle, we're looking into the half. And so the frontal lobe is here, and a, a part we're going to talk about is right here. It's a part that is a bridge between either hemisphere of your brain. It's called the corpus callosum. Here's the parietal lobe. Your occipital lobe is in the back. And then the cerebellum is down here. Of course, this is your brain stem. And then there's some other different parts in here. But the rest of them we don't really need to talk about. So playing music is the brain's equivalent to a full body workout. So you think about working your body. You work your quads and your calves and your hamstrings, your biceps, triceps. When someone plays music, it works all of the different parts of their brain, just like a workout works all of the parts of your body. Um, it engages almost every part of the brain all at once, especially the visual, auditory, and motor cortices. Each one of these is called a cortex on the outside. More than one cortex is a cortices. So all of those, auditory, your hearing, visual, your seeing, and motor, um, your movements. Playing music requires fine motor skills, which are found in both hemispheres of the brain. So fine motor skills. Let's look and see what are fine motor skills. Fine motor skills are the small, very because fine means small, precise movements we make with our hands, fingers, feet, and toes. And when we're making these movements, they involve a complex coordination of our muscles and our joints and our nerves. The nerves to send the information to your muscles and your joints, and then that's what makes them move. So we mainly think of your hand and your wrist and your finger movements uh, when it comes to fine motor skills. Typing would be a fine motor skill. Playing the piano, a fine motor skill. So picking up an object by pinching it with your forefinger and your thumb, that's a fine motor skill because you're using just minute actions and you're and improving on those. And you can also make fine movements with your foot, ankles, and toes when people dance. That's a fine motor skill that you're making specifically with your feet. Even if you're playing sports like soccer, those are fine motor skills. Playing music increases the volume of activity in that part we just talked about, the corpus callosum, that little link or the bridge between the two halves of your brain. It increases how much activity occurs there and links those two sides together. And it allows messages to get across the brain faster and in more diverse routes. And that allows musicians to solve problems more effectively and creatively in both um, academic and social settings. Because we've tied both hemispheres of the brain together, they make, there are more connections in there and it allows um, that person's brain to work more effectively. What about cognitive performance? So what is cognition? That's just the mental proper, um, processes involved when we gain knowledge and we comprehend. That's called cog your cognitive processes. If you read a book and then you learn new words, that would be cognition. Anytime that you know more than when you started, that's cognition. The processes are things like thinking, knowing, remembering, judging, and specifically problem solving. And problem solving requires multi-steps within your brain. You don't, it's just not one step. You have a problem and you have to work through different processes in order to get to a solution. Those are higher level functions of your brain. And they encompass language, imagination, perception, and planning. All of those things you need higher level order other than just running a race or jumping up and down. Um, those are low cognitive processes, not higher order. And then there are types. Attention, that allows people to focus on a specific stimulus in our environment. Language, of course, the ability to understand and express thoughts um, through spoken words and written words. Learning, that requires cognitive processes involved in taking in new things and we synthesize, we take those, that information and we integrate it with what we already know. That's how you learn. And learn could be something new, but you have to integrate it with something you already know in order to be able for your brain to process that information. And memory, and I put a little asterisk here, because that allows people to encode like you would in a computer and you store that information and then once it's in there you can go back and retrieve it and that's an important part of memory that's what memory is being able to retrieve that information so those are critical um, the critical component in the learning process and it allows people to retain their knowledge 
So at any time you can go back and retrieve those memories um, about their world and your personal history or what you've read or the things around you. Um, perception, that allows people to take in information through our senses, right? Your smelling, your hearing, your touch, your taste, um, your sight, those are all your senses. And then that we utilize that information to respond and interact with the world. And then thoughts. An essential part of every cognitive process allows people to engage in decision making, problem solving, and higher reasoning. Those are your thoughts. So just for your information, some split cognition into two categories, hot and cold. Hot cognition refers to those processes in which you have emotion involved in that thinking process. Uh, those are usually reward-based learning. Your, you know, uh, your teacher may say, if you memorize all of these, I will give you 10 extra minutes at recess. That's reward-based. You have an emotional investment in that. But cold cognition are just mental processes that don't have any feelings involved. You may just learn a list of words. That's cold cognition. So let's look at memory. And so we said that playing music also helps your memory, but how does memory work? So the creation of a memory requires um, a conversion of an amount of information that we perceive into a more permanent form. So you have to be able to store that information in, in order for it to be a memory. A subset of that memory will be secured in long-term um, storage. So something you may remember from 10, 20, 30, depending on how old you are, more, or more years ago. And you can use that in the future, long-term memory. Many factors during and after the creation of a memory influence what and how much gets preserved. And it also uh, it depends on if it was a traumatic experience, if it was a happy experience. A lot of those we remember more than just something that was kind of benign. Why do we have memories? A major function of memory in humans and other animals is to help us ensure that our behavior fits the present situation and that we can adjust it based on experiences. So even maybe a lot of things that I remember from a child and you're in church services or in school, the teacher or, or your parents require you to be quiet and sit there and pay attention. And if you didn't, that you might have gotten in trouble. So part of our memory is we learn now from that experience that we need to be quiet or sit still in that situation. So um, the first stage of memory is just the encoding process. A person's experience are converted into a form that can be stored in the brain. So I experience different things, my brain encodes it and stores it, sort of like a little file system. And people are more likely to encode details of what they are paying attention to, that makes sense. Um, storage or retention, that's um, the storage in which the information is preserved in memory following the initial encoding. So we encode it and then we um, store it or retain it. And that's memory consolidation, long-term memory. Your brain can't remember too many things and so it'll code them, it'll put them together and store them away for you to maybe get later. But once, as you continue to get older and you have more information, it'll start to delete some of that previous information. So those things are harder to remember that are farther away. Um, how does sleep affect your memory? It facilitates the retention of memories. So when you, people who sleep more show better memory performance. Um, sleep aids retention by eliminating that interference. If we're up, the light interferes, sound may interfere. Anything can interfere with your memory storage. But once you sleep, then that your brain is calm, puts everything else away, and it can help support the memory consolidation. That's why if you're studying for a test, a lot of people pull an all-nighter. They stay up all night and then go try to take a test. Not a good idea. You should study and sleep so that all that goes into your memory and is retained and then get up and take the test so that you have a better consolidation of your memory and it, it works better. So discipline structured practice strengthens those connections and allows the magi magician, it's hard for me to say that, to apply those connections to other things. So what other things can we apply them to? Um, those in the brain, synapses, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity just means the connections get stronger in your brain. Um, which part of the brain are important for memory? The hippocampus, we didn't talk about it. Um, the cerebral cortex, that's the outermost part of your brain. You have a part called the basal ganglia and the, and the amygdala. And the amygdala is involved in integration of emotional responses into memory. So memory involves changes to the brain's neural networks and neurons are connected by synapses, and I'll show you in a minute, which um, are bound together by neuro neurotransmitters, and those are chemical messengers, to form larger networks. So I drew just a little basic, these are two neurons, two nerves. 
The synapse is this gap in between the two nerves, and the neurotransmitters are the chemicals that act in this gap. So we have an impulse, we have a, a thought, comes down this neuron and causes these little pieces here to release the neurotransmitters, and then this neuron takes them up and keeps, so a lot of things, drugs, work here, and if you have neuroplasticity, we have better connections, faster, your brain works faster and better. That's what neuroplasticity is. And memory storage is thought to involve changes in the strength of these connections in between the, in between the neurons, in these synapses, and those are also linked to memory. Um, musicians have highly connected brains, therefore they exhibit enhanced memory functions. So their brains work better. They create, store, and retrieve their memories more quickly and efficiently. Because these, these are stronger, the connections here are stronger. They've strengthened those through the playing of the instrument, through the fine motor skills, through the memorization, through using different parts of your brain. Um, retrieval is a stage of memory in which the information in the saved memory is recalled. Um, sometimes so someone will, you'll see someone and you're like, what is that person's name? You recognize their face but you can't remember their name and you search and search and then it comes to you. You've retrieved that information from your memory. Um, they cr sorry, it follows uh, encoding and storage and it's like putting a name with the face. I just said that. Retrieval cue might be something that would help you to remember. Some kind of stimulus that takes your brain into, oh, now I remember that. It can be external. You could see an image of something that may help you to remember, a text message, a scent. Your sense of smell is most closely linked to memory because in your olfactory system, you have neurons that go up from your nose into your prefrontal cortex here. So it's close, more closely related to your brain. So usually something you smell will trigger a memory more so than something you see, something you hear. It's usually something you smell, but they can as well. Um, some other stimulus that relates to that memory, it could be internal. You have a thought or a sensation that is relevant to that memory. And so that, that's internal inside your, inside your brain. Sorry, there we go. And then those musicians have higher levels of executive function. What is that? That's the cognitive processes and mental skills that help an individual plan, monitor, and successfully execute their goals. Attention control, working memory, inhibition, problem solving, those originate in your prefrontal cortex here that I was just talking about. And then they're transferred to other parts of your brain. Uh, many experts believe that the human mind contains several different executive functions. Being aware of yourself, of course, we talked about inhibition. Nonverbal working memory starts here, and um, that's related to spatial information. Verbal working memory, that's related to language. Emotional regulation, motivational regulation, and planning and problem solving. So those are all of our higher order executive functions in our brain. And is, is that related to intelligence? And most of um, the studies that I looked at have found consistent overlap between executive function and general intelligence scores. Overall, the answer to does music boost your cognitive performance, the answer is yes, it does. But we've only looked at playing music. Does listening to music boost your cognitive performance? A lot of kids in school want to listen to their ear pods while, and music while they're doing their homework or while they're in school or while, and no matter where they are, in the car. And so let's take a quick look at that. Um, neuroscientists suggest, and they've had many trials, that listening to Mozart or other classical music improves, improves your performance, not by growing your brain, but by temporarily elevating your arousal and mood so that you perform better. So it's called the Mozart effect. And it's an example of arousal on performance, meaning arousal meaning it's just triggered your brain to work more. It, more synapses are clicking in there, and so your brain's ready to take on more information or to remember more things. Uh, can background music improve your concentration or is it a distraction? Uh, music may improve focus and concentration for some people when they're studying, but for others it can be distracting and have a negative impact on learning. So it would depend on who you are. The tempo, the speed or pacing of a piece of music, and tempo is Latin for time, um, of the music also has an effect on your cognitive performance. The genre of the music, whether it's rap music, country music, pop music, classical music, jazz music, all of those things. Um, the volume, how loud the music is, the tempo of the music, those all play a role in whether um, it helps people study. And, and does music help people focus? So there are several ways that music may be able to help your concentration and your focus. 
One, it can support um, performance in your cognitive task. And there's a 2019 study that looked at the effects of music at different volumes and complexities on people that were doing cognitive tasks, right? They're taking a task, they're reading a book, and it's silent, and then they play the music. So they found that music generally had a negative effect on performance in complex tasks. However, complex music improved performance in simple tasks. So the theory there is that complex pattern in the music is distracting that part of your brain and you can do simple things. More complex things is taking up more space and you can't do the more complex things. It can reduce stress or anxiety listening to music. Um, it can lower your pain levels. Sometimes I've seen people that are in labor listen to music. Uh, influence, uh, can it influence a memory? There was a 2015 study that looked at the effects of music on the psychological and physiological memory of facial recognition, seeing people's faces and remembering their names. And the researchers found that listening um, to emotionally touching music or silence improved memory and uh, resulted in faster and more efficient recall in, in whatever that memory that was tested. They also found that listening to low arousal music helps people recall more words from memory tasks than listening to high arousal music. Background music did not improve verbal memory performance more than silence. Why, does, why doesn't music always improve focus, listening to music? Um, the potential drawbacks are distraction. It can worsen your performance in reading comprehension tests because you're being distracted. Uh, it negatively affects on working memory. Working memory is the cognitive system for holding and retaining a certain amount of information just temporarily, just for a few minutes or for an hour. Um, a 2017 article, background music may uh, put an extra load on your working memory and it makes learning more difficult. Working memory capacity is the number of different concepts that, work, um, that working um, memory can deal with at a time. And the brain is limited to working memory capacity and music may reduce that capacity available for learning. Because you're listening and so that's part of your brain that's doing that. And so it's like texting and driving. You're not supposed to do that, right? Uh, what kind of music improves the focus the most? So this 2017 article said soft, fast music may have a beneficial effect on your learning. Loud music, either fast or slow, may have adverse effects on learning. Slow, soft music may also negatively affect learning, so it just depends. Instrumental music may distract less than music with lyrics, because you're listening to the words. Um, music, if it's just instrumental music, there are no words. And then familiarity with the music may also affect how people learn. If it's somebody I like, my most popular group, and I have it on my iPod or my phone, they don't know more iPods, and you're listening to the music, then you may want to sing with it, and it triggers different memories for you. If you've never heard it before, your brain doesn't really react to it, and so it may help you um, to learn. So I hope that you learned some things today about music, playing music, or listening to music, and how it affects memory. Maybe that'll help some of the decisions that you make riding around town. Thank you.